So for the macros part, uh, here, Ken. Thanks for that introduction. Ken <laughs> <laughs> did Can everybody read this? Yes. Is that, uh, Except for your name. You're not supposed to be able to read that very well. <laughs> um, red, blue, colored one. I guess it says TAN test 2004. <laughs> implying that there will, of course, be a 2005 Dan Fest. <laughs> so this is so much fun, we should keep doing it. OK, so today I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, guaranteed optimization clause of the Macro Writers Bill of Rights. I feel a little bit odd giving a talk about optimization, anything to do with efficiency. But truth be told, over the past several years, Dan has, is the person who has asked me the most, what will the compiler do with this when writing macros? And so I thought it was particularly appropriate, especially considering the, the background uh, of the macro system uh, and, and the work that he and his students did on it, and uh, the fact that he's the one that's irritated me with these questions the most. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have irritated him with my answers more often than, than not, too. Okay, so what is the Macro Writer's Bill of Rights? Uh, well, it's a set of vaguely worded promises on the part of the macro system to do certain things. Um, one is to provide a powerful pattern language, and this is not just any old pattern language, this has to be a language that's tailor-made for macro expansion. Allow arbitrary transformations, this basically means I wanna be able to use Scheme, I've got Scheme, I wanna, I wanna use everything in it. Unify high and, level, low, low, high and low level macros. I don't want to be writing in some rarefied pattern language until the problem gets a little bit harder and have to drop down in some low level bit bucket. Respect lexical scoping. Now that's a waffle worded thing if I ever saw one. What this basically means is whatever your transformation produces, it's the, the macro system has got to make sense uh, of the lexical scoping of that transformation. This doesn't mean that you can't transform, you can't write, you, it doesn't mean that you can't write a macro that transforms let into let rec and blows it. And you're perfectly allowed to do that because you can write arbitrary transformations, you can generate gibberish if you want to. But that gibberish has to be like this goat. <laughs> <laughs> now, permitting control capture, we want to be able to bend lexical scoping. We don't want to have to abandon it entirely, we want to be able to bend it to our purposes. We want to be able to introduce identifiers and sort of let them be visible in both findings and the references. Supporting local macros. This sounds like a luxury in a sense, if you think of it in terms of, well, you define your language and then using that language you write your programs. But in fact, Scheme is basically, uh, one of the principles of Scheme, it's in the first paragraph of the, of the revised report, is the way in which you can combine anything. You can combine in arbitrary ways the simple set of constructs, and one of those constructs is macro definition. You ought to be able to put that locally. You better take a whole program and embed it inside a let, deep inside another program, and still make sense of it. And so for that reason alone, we need local macros. Um, supporting modular use of macros, um, I think this is one that Oscar Waddell stuck in this to justify the fact that he had a module system and a macro system, both in his dissertation and he had to have some way of tying them together. <laughs> but actually it does make sense. Correlating source and object code, uh, it's a pitiful system to use that totally rewrites your program and, and destroys all relationship with the original source so that you can't correlate back to that original source. And if anybody was out at the uh, Scheme workshop and, and uh, watched some of Matthew's uh, students and, and other people working on Dr. Scheme and some of the mileage they got out of this, it's a really big deal. To, to get, you get a lot of mileage out of being able to correlate that. And then finally, we want to guarantee certain optimizations, both so that the macro writer can uh, focus on the general cases and also so that the macro writer isn't tempted to use macros for inappropriate optimizations. Okay. So, Going back to the uh, start here of the hygienic macro error, era, sorry, error. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was an error at first. Those who, who I 
I was drunk, kicking and screaming into it. Um, the Kohlbecker Friedman Polis and Dubik hygienic expansion algorithm combined with extended syntax provided some of these uh, rights the pattern language, the arbitrary transformation, and the high and low level macros are unified that there were just low level macros, or that there were just one kind. Um, uh, extend syntax was powerful enough to, 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 to get some low level stuff going. And finally, respecting lexicoscoping, of course. Now, a macro, uh, sorry, wrong way. Uh, syntax rules macro system provides a different set. Basically, it added the local macros, sort of, and it took away uh, the arbitrary transformation. Um, unfortunately, there's no internal defined syntax, and I, I see this as a, a major flaw. When I lost that argument, and I hope I win it in the future. But, um, and this means that you can't have mutually, mutually recursive variable and syntax definitions, or mutually recursive variable syntax and defined records and other derived macro definitions. So I think I, I view it as a pretty serious thing. Okay, I, I'm confused on which button to use here. Um, now, syntax case has all of, gives all of these rights. Everything is in syntax case. And you could either say, say that we uh, <coughs> created syntax case so that it would give us everything we wanted, or you could say that we tailor made the rights so that syntax case was satisfied. <laughs> And there's a little truth to the truth of both of them. Sometimes it's a left button and sometimes it's the right. Depends on what side you're standing. <laughs> I'll stand over here then. Okay. So, how do we get the guaranteed optimization? That one right denied us by syntax case. We add in CP0, compiler pass zero. It's actually the fourth pass after macro expansion, but who's counting? It's also employed by Petit Chase Scheme's interpreters. So if you download Petit Chase Scheme and use it, you'll also get the guaranteed optimization there. Um, you might wonder if Petit Chase Scheme is really an interpreter. Um, it's really a four or five pass compiler that produces interpretable um, thread code. It performs a set of uh, source optimizations we'll talk about, we'll talk about, and um, we've uh, started working on this in 96, 97 and, and made several improvements since then. Uh oh, I'm not going to use the other button. This is really ridiculous. Okay. I guess I just have to hit it multiple times. So what is guaranteed optimization? What's the point? The point is to reduce the abstraction overhead. And uh, there is always a penalty to using any kind of abstraction. We want to reduce that. We can't pretend that we're going to eliminate it. But we can reduce the abstraction overhead. Um, we want to take away an incentive that the programmer might feel to use macros when macros really aren't necessary syntactically, but they're just using them to do some sort of bit level optimizations. There's still a purpose for using macros for optimizations that simply can't be done by a compiler, things that are basically unsound except in a particular environment. And then if maybe the main goal is when you're writing a macro and you see that, well, if it only takes, it only has one expression, I can do this other thing that's simpler. Or if, if only it comes in with a variable, I can do this other thing that's simpler. I don't have to introduce a let binding or something like that. Or only if it's constant, I can fold that constant and, and get better code out of it. We don't, want to have to make, we don't want people to have to think about that. We want them to focus on the general case and let the compiler do its job. Okay. So here's an example that came up in uh, advanced compiler class uh, of doing revised file report let rec. So basically, the revised report says, the semantics of let rec is the following. We've got to bind the variables. Then we evaluate the expressions and the scope of those variables. We do that in any or order. Then we, after we've done the, all the evaluations, then we do all the assignments of the variables to the values, resulting values. And finally, we evaluate the body and the scope of the new bindings. Okay. Here is the code essentially from the revised reply report with the two or three bugs eliminated. <laughs> and this is just to give you an indication that using syntax rules for this purpose and doing it in this style uh, is a little bit complex because what this bas what's basically going on is we're using a helper to generate the temporaries we need. And then finally at the end, we can, now that we have all our temporaries and they're all uniquely named because each step of the macro, each recursive step of the macro gave us a new name, now we have a set of unique T's, 
we can now generate the code we want to generate, which finds the variables, evaluates the expressions in some arbitrary order, does the assignments, and then evaluates the body. And the let nil there is let nil there is there to uh, handle internal defiance of error. Here's what it looks like in syntax case. Uh, a lot more straightforward because we just generate the temporaries. We have a little generate temporaries routine we can use, and we're allowed to pull our language so we use it. And we get, get this done more directly. Either case, either way, here's what it expands into. You get this uh, simple f that calls g and g that calls f. Never mind that it's an infinite loop. And because macro expander has got to terminate it anyway. Um, and we have this structure that's kind of obvious given the transformation. Well, a much more clever transformation that the plot right, uh, was brought to my attention by Ron Garcia is in the class um, from uh, Petrovsky. And basically this one doesn't, it's used as syntax rules, but it doesn't involve this recursive helper that generates temporaries. Why? Because it reuses, whoops, it reuses the names. We have the X's up there being used, being bound, that's fine. And then we use the X's as temporaries for thunks that will do the assignments. Okay, it's really quite clever. And then the body is bound here as well, so that it is also, as with the right hand sides of these bindings, scoped where they can see the original X's, not the new ones. <laughs> right, this is this is killer, okay? <laughs> Personally, I would write it the way I wrote it in syntax case because it's more straightforward. But this is definitely better from a cleverness standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the expansion isn't quite as cool. The expansion gives us all these extra bindings and thunks and calls. We get basically three extra bindings, three extra Lambda expressions, procedures being built, and they actually have free variables, so they're not things that can be built at compile time, and three procedure calls that we didn't have in the original transformation. <laughs> However, after optimization, <laughs> someday, this is what we get. This should look kind of familiar. After the guaranteed optimizations kick in, we get essentially the code we had for Levrec. Who sees the difference for the original? The let nil is gone. That's the only difference. But of course, the let nil would be gone from the other transformation too. So in essence, they generate exactly the same code. Okay. So with guaranteed optimization, a macro programmer can count on a certain set of optimizations being performed. Cross-employed propagation, procedure inlining, dead and useless code elimination, and a few ad hoc uh, degenerate case optimizations. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Just all these are pretty obvious, so I'll go through this kind of fast. But constant folding, basically, we fold primitive calls. And there's some that we can fold and some that we can't. We can fold all of these, but we can't fold random 10 to 6. That would be rather disappointing in your game. Or <laughs> very. Right? You can't fold list 1, 2, 3 into 1, 2, 3 and quote 1, 2, 3, and this hurts. This really does hurt. It's, a, it's unfortunate. But you can't do it because some clown may be side effecting the result of this call and expecting it to be a new list each time. Right? And you can't even do this with remove because remove allocates new lists to hold the, the, the new contents AC. Copy propagation. With copy propagation, we take bindings of variables to something that's fairly simple, a constant or another variable, and we just simply replace the new variable with the uh, old right-hand side, wherever it occurs. And so we can take uh, three and propagate both occurrences of x in the first one. We can take the uh, y, it's bound to x, and replace the occurrence of y with x in the second one. We can take the, um, the, the, the y here and replace it, um, sure. place this y with x over here. And notice that we're crossing a procedure boundary. This is a totally interprocedural um, optimizer. We can even propagate quoted lists, although this doesn't seem sound and wouldn't be sound at the source level because it would break EQ. It's sound at the in, 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 in th at this level of Chase Games compiler because it maintains EQ of, of even 
destroy even separated structures right, through linkage. Some copy propagation we can't do, basically the only time we can do it is when there's side effects involved. And Chasekin completely punts on, CP0 completely punts on any side effects. There's a side effect to either the right-hand side variable or the right -hand, left hand side variable or the right hand side is a variable, then we don't do, I couldn't read that. That's good. Because this compiler is not working with fast code. For yeah, that's right. Side effects should be used only when they can't be eliminated. And in which case, um, we have a hard time dealing with it. Okay. We, the reason we do this is, is uh, because uh, the end, we, we want to keep the optimizer linear. And it's difficult. And, and, and all in one pass. And it's difficult to do the analysis and inlining one pass. Okay. So procedure inlining is really just a special case or a different case of copy propagation. In essence, all we're doing is we're taking the body of a definition or a let rec or a let or something like that bound variable that happens to be bound to a lambda expression and we're replacing occurrences of that variable with a lambda expression. Except we only do it in call position. So we'll only do it in here. But if, if E1 were, say, the, the variable min, we wouldn't replace it there. Okay? Now, after some set of transformations, that, that position may find itself in call position. At that point, we'd be able to do it. Okay? So we basically put the lambda expression there in place of the variable min, and that's really just the same as writing this let. <coughs> that's what I'm going to be showing. Okay. Why, so why is it why is it that we have to eliminate the definition of min in that place? Okay. Well, here and in the copy propagation slides, yes. um, I don't show this because what's that's really the job of the dead and loose uses code elimination. Okay. So we can do that, and you might consider that part of the same optimization, but in fact. Especially in the case of procedure inlining, you don't do that as part of the inlining itself because there may be some non call position references to min, and therefore we might have to keep min around and propagate the, the value into some other places. Now, the other thing to note about the procedure inlining is that it's a, it's a uh, dangerous thing to do if you want your compiler to terminate. You have to be really careful, or if you don't want your code to explode. So inlining is not nearly as easy as copy propagation. It's not, it, it's, it's, the transformation is as easy as this. And once you've done the transformation, the copy propagation and constant form that can go on here will simplify the code for you. But deciding whether to do it, that's the hard part. Then useless code elimination. This is real simple stuff like you have an if with a constant test. You have a begin that has a, a, a non-effect expression. You have a, a useless let binding, like the ones we produced as was rather used on the copy of propagation, or a useless let right binding or, or internal definition. In fact, say scheme at this level doesn't have internal definitions. I'm only using internal, it has only let rack. Uh, I'm only using internal definitions for illustration. Degenerate case optimizations, I wouldn't even bother listing these, because these are just kind of simple things, trivial things that most compilers just do. You just you know, don't make a big deal out of it. But these happen to have particular relevance when you're writing macro expansion. To know that these things happen is particularly important because one of the things you want to avoid is special case code. To say, well, if my, list is, if my set of variables is empty, I don't want to actually have a call to list in my code. I want just the empty list. And you're not tempted to do that because it'll do this replacement for you. I have an empty case. I want to know that if I have an empty case, well, that's be, that'd be memv, but if I have an empty case, that the memv is going to actually produce false for me so that I can choose which clause I'm taking and, and know that this one's not going and throw it away. Okay, so what is the impact of all this? What is the impact we hope for in all this? We want to introduce, uh, so we, we want to allow the macro programmer to be able to introduce lead bindings wherever necessary to prevent duplicate evaluation or any other reason. We want them to be able to do, use lambda abstractions to avoid code duplication. Call the procedure multiple times instead of having multiple occurrences of the expression. The expression may be large. Ignore special cases involving constants. Kind of purpose of constant folding and, and um, the de degenerate optimizations. And, in order, and ignore degenerate cases involving the debtor useless code. Okay? You don't want to have to 
to say, well, it's not going to generate anything useful here. You just go ahead and let it generate the empty list or the void value or whatever it might be and let the compiler throw it away. And most importantly, we want to be able to count on the compiler to clean all this up. So let's see how Petrovsky's expansion works. Um, here's, the, here's the original expansion. There's the inlining basically uh, happens in two steps. First, we have to pull those let bindings out. These let bindings for T1 and T2 are in the way of the let bindings for F1 and G1 to the lambda expression. And we couldn't automatically inline them down here because T1 isn't visible here and T2 isn't visible here. So we pull them out, and we can only do this in certain circumstances, but we pull them out for the purposes of inlining. There's no other reason to pull them out. It doesn't, doesn't help anything if we don't inline. We pull them out so that we can inline. We get that. Now we can inline, and we replace each one of these with the, the body of the lambda expression. And then we throw away all the dead code, all the useless code, all the useless findings. And that's how we get that. So it's a fairly, it's really a fairly tame application of the guaranteed optimization. Here's a little different problem, and I know this is a realistic problem, one that I've actually dealt with. I've got reams of code uh, in a couple of different assemblers to generate really good, really, really fast assemblers. And it's always irritated me that I've had to have reams of code to generate a really good assembler. And I'm sure some of you had similar experiences. Basically, I have a really simple assembler here, but I'll tell you it works just as well for the much more complicated one. We have two syntactic forms in the simple one, emit, some instruction name, some set of arguments, and reg, some register name. The purpose of emit is to, is to send somewhere a word representing the instruction. I'm assuming something like risk architecture in this example. And reg is to give us the, the code that corresponds to a particular register. And here's an example of a little procedure that takes a register as an argument. We don't know what that register is. And generates these three instructions. Right? And you notice that these two instructions are entirely constant. And most of this one is entirely constant. I probably should have this in red, and that in red, and that in red. Most, we know most of the th stuff we need to know about this one. This should be just you know, emitting a word of, of a known number that we compute at compile time. This one too. This one should be boiling down to an addition of a known number and whatever R it ends up being at runtime. Right. So here's the code that I would have written a few years ago for this. Define syntax emit. And then I go through one case at a time. I probably would have done a little better than this, but you get the idea. One case at a time. If I got all three registers, great. Then I can compute my instruction at compile time with this messy code and emit that instruction. If I have a register, an immediate, and a register, and I see that immediate really is an integer, then do the same thing. If I have, well, obviously it's not enough, it doesn't even fit on the screen that way or that way. It's really gross. Instead, I'd prefer to write this. And this is what I would write today. And this is what I did write today. Here's the code. So we're assuming a little simple risk architecture. We have opcode starting, you're going from 27 to 31, bit 27 to 31, source right below that, source register. Um, the uh, source two position at the very bottom of the world, word, it's either, a, it's either an immediate, 16-bit immediate, or a five-bit register. Uh, destination post that's right underneath the source one, and an immediate bit that tells us whether we have, whether the, the, the second source operand is immediate or not, stuck at bit 16. We have a set of register operations, obviously the set would be larger in a realistic assembler, and a set of immediate operations, and we have a set of register codes. And I would have added more here except there wasn't room on the slide. And then we have the reg. Reg just does cutter ASSQR reg codes. Now, in my original version of this, I had some error checking in here, but I thought that was kind of foul. You know, in honor of Dan, I took that out. And, <laughs> but I assure you, it works just as well if you have error checking code. <laughs> um, here is the emit we just saw in the couple screens ago. 
and it calls this emit helper, which for all the world is a runtime procedure. But because of the optimizer, we're going to get some of it running at compile time. And basically, it does the obvious thing. It emits a word with results from adding whatever opcode and possibly the immediate that we have to the values of our three arguments properly shifted into the right places. This is what we get after optimization of that. We get exactly what we want. Okay. And so this is about knowing what the optimizer is going to do and taking advantage of it. I could have written this code in different ways. But knowing what the optimizer would do, I wrote it in a certain way, and I got the result I wanted. And I got this on my first try. All right, some caveats. Unfortunately, there's always caveats. The inlining guarantee is a bit weak. We always inline when we have a single call site. If there's a procedure with a single call site, we always inline. Well, sort of. We always inline if that single call site doesn't itself get replicated in multiple places. Right? If in the original program there's a single call site in F, and F gets plopped down in three places, then now there's three call sites to G within F. And we can't inline G. We don't necessarily inline G in that case. So it really has to be one call site in the residual program, not one call site in the source program. We always do it for trivial procedures. Now that's a good guarantee if I ever saw one. What's a trivial procedure? Well, I know that a trivial procedure is something like lambda x, x, lambda x, 0, lambda x plus x, x. I have a really good intuition myself what a trivial procedure is, and I'm rarely too far off. But the challenge is in, in getting other people to understand that. Otherwise, it depends on the size of the residual code and how long it takes to, to do the inlay. The size of the, of the residual code, not the size of the source code. The source code may be huge. You saw the code for emit. It's fairly large. Okay? We're not going to inline that. But because when we pass it some arguments that happen to be constant, the residual code ends up being fairly small, and we are going to inline that. Okay? So it depends on the size of the residual code, which is sometimes hard to estimate when you're, when you're looking at it yourself as a human being, and that makes the guarantee a little weak. And then the compile time inlining cost, well, sometimes that cost is infinite. If you try to inline the you know, omega, for example, the size never grows. And you say, hey, fine, I'm doing great on size, but you can never make any progress. So the inlining cost, we, try to, we, we, we keep the inlining cost um, low and linear. Maybe you don't have to be that draconian, but it works pretty well. Um, and we certainly try to keep it finite. And that would be a requirement that would, someone would want to take at any time. Other caveats, propagation, inlining, uh, these only take place within a compilation unit. And for us, a compilation unit is a top-level expression, a single top-level expression. That's because we're, we have a top-level environment where if you define something in a top-level environment, um, it's mutable. And you can't inline a procedure that's defined a top-level inside some other top-level procedure. So you have your Procedures that you get inlined have to be local. What bindings you have to inline have to be local to a given top-level expression. But you can use include to insert arbitrary code in there. And that's what we often do. We often have a program that has like module with a set of includes for all the different files. Each of those files may themselves be modules. The, another advantage is the modules can be mutually recursive. And you can pass a scheme an absolutely enormous program, and it will, it will swallow it. It's not a, not big deal. So you can have, I've, I've compiled 100,000 lines of code in not all in one file, but using include, all that's one compilation unit. That's because we take great care of having linear algorithms like this in line. And constant pulling only takes place when the primitives are known, and so you want to use an import scheme to get the built-in set of primitives um, somewhere in your, in your top-level form. Okay. No ADA reduction. This is one that Dan's bugged me about repeatedly. And um, this one we discovered in, we, we talked about, we uncovered this in our advanced compiler course just yesterday. Um, but there are a number of problems with ADA conversion. Sure. And um, it's really a kind of a shame. It would, take a, it would take a set of restrictions and lazy evaluation, like you might see in Haskell, to 
uh, be able to do this optimization. Basically, you could do this in Haskell because of the, the restrictions of the type system and, uh, and the uh, lack of call CC and the lazy evaluation. Um, I'm not even positive about that. Okay. Some final remarks. Um, guarantee optimization really does help. So far, it really does help me and Oscar, those who are in the know. Okay, other people have to puzzle about what's happening. Um, it works both for syntactic abstraction and for procedural abstraction. You know, same, same things apply, but uh, the effect is even greater for syntactic. Um, and of course, we have to do a better job, we need to do some job of documenting this and formalizing it. Now, several years ago, a group of people tried to formalize the proper treatment of tail recursion and failed. I don't know what's going to take to formalize these kind of optimizations and the guarantees thereof. Wish list, the way to specify domain specific optimization. That's sort of next on the list. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, there's actually a simpler way to write flat track that has no recursion and no set, and it has full semantics that's required. Cool. To right? You'll have to show it to me and we'll type it yeah, in. Yeah, it's actually the idea is that you use a list. I mean, when you put all initialization expressions into the list, then all the magic happens. I mean, the argument initialized in arbitrary order, everything happens. And then you replace flat track with let star, which you can generate the star star. She deconstructs this list and assigns kind of. So there are no assignments, and you know, less task than what keeps, I mean, overriding it. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that offline. Shaskin doesn't use this transformation at all anyway. It does its own Taylor expansion. But. Yeah. Just a comment. So you've been sort of been leading up to suggesting that this ought to be something that you can rely on. It's already part of the spec. Yeah, to be in the standard. I have an attitude about guaranteed optimization means I don't have to rely on it, which is, when I'm writing a macro, I say, well, if, if I'm using a, some, a compiler written by someone who has that together, like Shayskin, then I'll get what I wanted. I'll get what I'm intending to get. I'll make a such a ser series of basically conservative assumptions about what kind of optimizations. And if I'm not getting, using one of those compilers, well then, obviously, efficiency wasn't an issue, was it? That I wasn't using a serious <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm using some simple little byte code system or and then, you know, and then if, See, I do that if, with I, if I cared about the kind of code I was getting, once I've got my program running and tested and debugged, then I better go get a real compiler. Yeah, that's why. And, and it gives you a certain freedom, a certain attitude. You don't yeah. have to like obsess about whether or not you're going to get it. Right, I agree. I agree. And I do that when, I, like I said, I do that with Shay Scheme. I know Shay Scheme's brain damaged in multiple ways that I'll never tell anybody about. <laughs> and I, but I say, well, a sufficiently smart compiler would do this, therefore I don't pretend to Shay Scheme. Useful have you found expand, expand syntax for convincing somebody or at least giving them a feel for how well the system does? Or is that. Is well, that no, you can't. I mean, if you just expand, you don't get to see it. You have to, you have to use some deep magic to see what the optimizer is actually doing. So you, you can't just. Right. I've got a little script that I load when I want to see what it does, and it and it fits so, up. So that's not user available yet? Not yet, but it should be. Because that, I mean, that, that way, instead of having standards, that would help. You that would at least say, this is what we're doing right that now. That would tell you what it does for a particular instance, but then it, may not help as much as you think guiding your future use. Yeah. So, you know, the wish list obviously is, is extremely attractive. Yeah. Is there, you know, anything by way of Oh there was a there was an NSF grant proposal that got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all the progress we made. So C P zero is not documented in any way of that. It's not is it documented in some way that we can add procedures to C P zero? Oh my god. I mean, I wouldn't trust, I barely trust myself modifying CP0 right now. It's not documented well enough. One more question. Does CP0 even have the property that the optimizations that you specified commute? That is, if you apply them in a different order, you still get the same result and still have the same um, uh, termination criteria and limits and whatever? Um, no. If I understand your, your question correctly, no. It goes to great lengths to get all the cascading optimiz optimizations done, but you can actually benefit from running CP0 multiple times. We found the benefit for running it the second time to be extremely minimal in most cases, and the benefit from running it more than two times to be pretty, pretty much neg negligible. Um, but no, 
though there is no, because it's a linear thing, and you know we're focused on getting it done, sometimes we have to cut it off when, when otherwise it wouldn't make progress. There are, there are cases where you don't get, because it doesn't iterate until there's a fixed point, there are cases where you don't get as much cascading as, as what you I'm possibly say, get. What I'm saying is that the mental model that I have to have for something like inlining is not just what the criteria are under which inlining happens, but also the order in which you apply the inlining optimization. They all, they all get, that will affect the limits. Yeah, no, I don't, actually, I don't, that's not quite true. But I need to document it so that you understand why that's not true. Uh, basically, the inlining happens, and then, and then whatever copy propagation concept holding and further inlining can happen, and then more inlining and copy propagation happens. It's not like you just do one, then another, and then another, and another in sequence. Little they have paths, is which they all happen at once. Yeah, but they all happen at once. It's all completely online. And it's, it, you I think maybe I didn't make my question clear. So if, if code size is a constraint on whether inline happens or not, then copy propagation can affect code size. Yeah, and it's well, you can understand how that works. If I, if I, if I describe it right, we can look in the paper for one thing, SAS 97 paper and see pretty much how it works. There's, a, there's an algorithm given in there. And you can see how it works, and, and you can predict from there what's going to happen. Um, but there are details, of course, that aren't that have changed over the years and aren't specified. That maybe get specified, but you, you really you can predict. It's not that hard. Well, thanks very much.